Hello, and welcome to Bill Russo's Short Story Theatre. The Hounds of Fate. It is the title of today's play. The Hounds of Fate. They are relentless. If you hide in the trees they will sniff you out. If you wander far off in a desert, their keen eyes will spot you. If you hide in someone's shadow, the hounds, with sharp teeth bed, will attack you. Young Martin Hunter, a wanderer, in old New England 200 years ago, is about to set out on a journey. He thinks he is alone, but behind him, hiding behind the trees, are the hounds of fate. light of a dull afternoon in September, Martin Hunter plodded his way along muddy roads and cart tracks that he thought led to the ocean. Somewhere in front of him, he thought, was the ocean. And towards the sea, his footsteps seemed persistently turning, don't you know? Why he was struggling weary forward to that goal, he could scarcely understand, don't you know? The hounds of fate was certainly pressing him with unrelenting insistence. Hunger, fatigue, and despairing homelessness had numbed his brain, and he even lacked enough energy to wonder what was driving him forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, Hunter was one of those unfortunate individuals who seemed to have tried everything and failed each and everything they tried. And now he was at the end of his tether and there was nothing more to try. Yeah, he was ready to give up, don't you know? He owned the ragged clothing that he was wearing and a crumpled dollar bill in his pocket, and nothing else. He had no friend or acquaintance to turn to, and no prospect either for a bed for the night or a meal for the next morning's breakfast. Martin Hunter trudged slowly forward along a worn-out road, and beneath dripping trees, his mind almost a blank, except that he was subconsciously aware that somewhere in front of him was the ocean. He seemed to care little for life and wasn't certain he wanted to carry on anymore. But there was one emotion he did have well, twan't really an emotion, but rather a disturbing and empty feeling in the stomach. It was hunger. Almost starved to death he was. It was hunger alone that kept him alive. After slowly negotiating a bend in the road, he noticed an open gate. That gate led to a spacious, but neglected garden and a farmhouse. Well, there was little sign of life about, and the farmhouse at the farther end of the garden looked cold and certainly did not look inviting. A drizzling rain was coming down, however, and Martin thought that perhaps he might be able to get a few minutes shelter and maybe buy a glass of milk and a few pieces of bread with butter with his last remaining dollar bill. So he turned slowly and wearily into the garden, and he followed a narrow path of broken flagstones up to a side door. Before he had time to knock on the door, it opened, and a bent, withered-looking old man stood aside in the doorway, as though to let him pass in. Could I come in out of the rain? Why, it's Mr. Tom. Come in, 
Mr. Tom, I knew you would come back one of these days. Sit down while I get a bit of supper ready for you. Well, as the old man who opened the door went to fetch some food, Martin's legs gave way from weariness, and he sank into the armchair that had been pushed up to him. In another minute, he was devouring chunks of cold fried chicken, cheese, and bread that had been placed on the table before him. You have not changed at all these four years that you've been gone, Mr. Tom, but you'll find us a great deal changed. You will. There's no one about the place same as when you left, except me and your old aunt. I'll go and tell her that you've come back. She won't be seeing you, but she'll let you stay right enough. She always did say if you were to come back you should stay, but she said that she will never set eyes on you or speak to you again. Well, sir, the old man placed a mug of beer on the table in front of Martin and then hobbled away down a long passage. The drizzle of the rain had changed to a furious lashing downpour which beat violently against the doors and the windows. The wanderer thought with a shudder of what the seashore must look like under this drenching rainfall, with night beaten down on all sides. Where well, Martin finished the food and the beer, and he sat numbly waiting for the return of his strange host. As the minutes ticked by on the grandfather clock over there in the corner, a new hope began to flicker and grow in the young man's mind. It was merely the expansion of his former craving for food and a few minutes rest into a longing to find a night's shelter under this seemingly hospitable roof. A clattering of footsteps down the passage sounded the return of the old caretaker of the farm. The old missus won't see you, Mr. Tom, but she says you are to stay. And that is right enough, seeing the farm will be yours when she's gone and buried under the ground. I've had a fire lit in your room, Mr. Tom, and the maid has put fresh sheets onto the bed. You'll find nothing changed up there. Maybe you are tired and would like to go there now. Well, sir, without a word, Martin rose heavily to his feet, and he followed the caretaker along the passage, up a short creaking stairway, along another passage, and into a big room lit with a cheerfully blazing fire. The furniture was plain, old-fashioned and sturdy enough. There was a stuffed squirrel in a case and a wall calendar from four years ago. And they was the only decorations in the room. But Martin didn't care. He had eyes for nothing else except that bed and could scarcely wait to tear his clothes off him before rolling in a luxury of clean sheets and a soft bed, don't you know? The hounds of fate seem to have taken a brief pause in the life of Martin. In the cold light next morning, Martin slowly realized the position that he found himself in. Well, he decided he might grab a bit of breakfast on the strength of his likeness to this other missing person and then get safely away before anyone discovered that he was a fraud. In the room downstairs, he found the bent old man ready with a dish of bacon and fried eggs for Mr. Tom's breakfast while a hard-faced elderly maid brought in a teapot and poured him a cup of tea. He wanted coffee, but he didn't say nothing, and he drank the tea. While he sat at the table, 
a small dog came up and made friendly advances. That little dog is old Spotted Lady's pup. Spotted Lady was right fond of you, Mr. Tom. And she never seemed the same after you went away to Australia. She died about a year ago. This is her pup. Say, would you like to go for a ride, Mr. Tom? We've got a nice gray roan. She's a gray horse, and she will show you all around your property, not that you have forgotten it. I'll have the little roan saddled and brought round to the door. Well, Martin liked the idea of taking a ride on the hoss, but he said I got no riding things. As he looked down at his one suit of worn-out clothing. Mr. Tom, why, all your things are just as you left them. A bit of airing before the fire, and they'll be all right. You will find the folks around here do have hard and bitter minds towards you. They have not forgotten, and they have not forgiven. No one will even come near you, so you best get what distraction you can with the horse and the dog. They are good company. Well, old George hobbled away to give his orders, and Martin, feeling more than ever like somebody inside of a dream, went upstairs to inspect Mr. Tom's wardrobe. A ride was one of the pleasures dearest to his heart, and there was some protection against immediate discovery of his deception in the thought that none of Tom's old companions was likely to get close enough to him to realize that he was an imposter. As Martin put on some riding clothes that fit him perfect, he wondered what manner of misdeed, what bad thing did the genuine Tom do to set the whole countryside against him? Well, the thud of quick, eager hoofs on damp earth cut short his speculations. The gray roan had been brought up to the side door. Martin quickly mounted the horse and trotted rapidly along the muddy roads where he had tramped yesterday when he was a down-at-the-heel outcast. After a minute, he stopped thinking of himself as an imposter and he enjoyed the pleasure of a fast canter along the grassy side of a level stretch of road. At an open gateway, he checked his pace to allow two horse-drawn wagons to turn into a field. The men driving them carts found time to give him a prolonged stare. They stared at him as he passed by. He heard an excited voice call out, Why, it's Tom Prike. I knowed him at once. Who'd have thought that he'd ever dare to show his face here again? Evidently, the likeness which had fooled old George was good enough to mislead younger eyes as well. In the course of his ride, he met with plenty of evidence to confirm the statement that the local people had neither forgotten nor forgiven the bygone crime which had fallen to Martin as a legacy from the absent Tom. Scowling looks, mutterings, and scowls greeted him whenever he rode near human beings. The only element of friendliness that he found was from old Bowker's pup, trotting quietly along by his side. As he got off the hoss at the side door of the farmhouse, he caught a fleeting glimpse of a gaunt elderly woman peering at him from behind the curtain of an upper window. Evidently, this was his aunt by adoption. Over a good midday meal that stood in readiness for him, Martin was able to review the possibilities of his strange situation. Hey, uh, the real Tom, after four years of being absent, might suddenly turn up 
at the farm or a letter might come from him at any time. Well, again, in the character of the heir to the farm, the false Tom might be called on to sign paperwork, documents, which would be an embarrassing predicament. Or a relative might arrive who would realize that he was not the real Tom. Well, all these things would mean he would be exposed as a fraud. But, on the other hand, don't you know, the alternative was the open sky and the muddy roads that led down to the ocean. With his tattered clothing and not a penny in his pocket, that was the alternative. To be a papa again, no money. And on the other hand, the farm offered him at least a temporary refuge from destitution. And farming was one of the many things that he had tried. And he would be able to do a certain amount of work in return for the hospitality to which he was not entitled. Well, the hard-faced maid came in and she said, as she cleared the table from lunch, would you like chicken or steak for supper tonight? Martin said, steak and with plenty of fried potatoes. He said that he wanted steak and fried potatoes. It was the only time in his life that he had made a quick decision. And as he gave that order to the maid, he knew that he was going to stay on that farm. Over the next couple of days, Martin started doing some work on the farm. Old George, the gray roan horse, and Bowker's pup were his only friends in a world that was otherwise silent and hostile. Well, of the old lady who owned the farm, he saw nothing. Once, when he knew she had gone to church, he made a hasty visit to the living room of the farm in an effort to get some information, some knowledge of the young man whose place he had taken and whose bad deeds he had fastened onto himself. Well, there was many pictures hung on walls and pictures stuck in frames, but the likeness he looked for was not among them. At last, in an album on the highest shelf, the highest shelf, he came across what he wanted. There was a whole series labeled Tom. Well, first he was a pudgy child of three in a funny looking coat. Then there was another picture of an awkward boy about 12 years old holding a baseball bat. Then there was another picture of a good looking young man of 18 years age with very smooth and evenly parted hair. And finally, a picture of a young man with a daredevil expression. At this last picture, Martin looked with particular interest. The face in the picture, he said to himself, looks exactly like me. Well, from old George, he tried again and again to learn something of the nature of the crime which had shut him off as a creature to be shunned and hated by everybody. What do the people around here say about me, he asked one day as they were walking home from a field, and the old man just shook his head and said, they're against you. They're against you. It's a sad business. It's a sad business. They're against you. And never after that would he say anything more about the situation. Well, on a clear, frosty evening a few days before Christmas, 
Martin stood in a corner of the orchard, which commanded a wide view of the countryside. Here and there, he could see the twinkling dots of lamps or candles glowing, which told of human houses where the good will and good cheer of the holiday season was in full swing. Behind him lay the grim, silent farmhouse, where no one ever laughed, where even an argument would have seemed cheerful. As he turned to look at the long, gray front of the gloomy building, a door opened, and old George came hurriedly in. Martin heard George calling his name. He was very anxious. Instantly, Martin knew that something had happened, and with a quick sadness, his sanctuary became in his eyes a place of peace and contentment from which he did not want to leave. The old man said, Mr. Tom, you got to slip away quietly from here for a few days. Michael Lay is back in the village. Michael Lay swears to shoot you if he can find you. You'll do it too. There's murder in the look of him. Get away under cover of night. It's only going to be for a week or so. He won't be here any longer than that. But where am I to go? Said Martin, who shared the old man's obvious terror. Go right away along the coast to to Nashua and keep hidden there. When Michael's gone, I'll ride the gray roan over to the hearth and stein at Portland and at, at, at Nashua. When, when you see the gray roan horse stabled there, it'll be a sign you can come back again. You'll be all right for money. The old missus has given you $300. Now you best do as I say. So the old man handed Martin a stack of money that had amounted to $300, enough to keep him at the hearth and stein for months if he had to be there. Martin felt even more of a cheat than ever as he stole away that night from the back gate of the farm with the old woman's money in his pocket. Old George and Barker's pup stood watching him in a silent farewell from the yard. He could scarcely believe that he would ever come back, and he felt a throb of guilt for those two humble friends who would wait hopefully for him to come back. Someday, perhaps the real Tom would come back, and there would be wild wonderment among those simple folks in the farm as to the identity of the shadowy guest that they had harbored under their roof. Well, sir, for his own fate, Martin felt no immediate anxiety. 300 bucks was not a fortune, but to a man who used to count his money in quarters and the occasional dollar, it seemed like a big enough stake so that he could start a new life. Fortune had done him a kind turn when at last he got back on those roads. As he got further away from the farm, his spirits, spirits rose even higher. There was a sense of relief in regaining once more his lost identity and ceasing to be the uneasy ghost of another. He scarcely bothered to speculate about the enemy who had dropped from nowhere into his life. For the first time for many months, Martin began to hum a callous, light-hearted rendition of Bye Bye Blackbird. Pack up all my cares and woes, here I go, singing low, Bye Bye Blackbird. Just then, from the shadow of an overhanging oak tree, there stepped out a man with a gun. There was no need to wonder who he might be. 
The moonlight fallen on his grim face revealed a glare of human hate such as Martin in the ups and downs of his wanderings had never seen before. He sprang aside in a wild effort to break through the hedge that bordered the road, but the tough branches held him fast. The hounds of fate had waited for Martin in those narrow lanes, and this time they were not to be denied. And so closes The Hounds of Fate, presented by Short Story Theater. Today's play was narrated by our producer and director Bill Russo. Our shows are on all podcast sites from Amazon and Apple to the end of the alphabet. Our whole network is Spreaker, that's like speaker, with an R after the SP. This is Melody Song, speaking for Bill Russo, thanking you for listening and inviting you to come back again real soon. Won't you?